So at Facebook, my current project is working on images. Um, more than anything else, Facebook is an application to look at your friends' photos. There's lots of other things in there. More than anything else, people care about photos. They like to look at them, they like to comment on them, like them, share them, you name it. So we're an application that is constantly downloading photos off the internet and showing them to users. And this causes a lot of problems. And so this talk today is about some of the tips and tricks of handling images in Android. How do you prevent it from performing poorly? How do you prevent it from crashing your device? The single biggest thing to remember about programming on Android is that devices are small, images are large. So, although device memory has gotten a lot bigger in recent years, used to have you know, 384 meg, 512 meg phones, now we have 1 gigabyte phones, even some 2 gigabyte phones are coming out. You don't get all that memory. The device manufacturer sets the heap size for your application. And that heap size is usually about one tenth of the memory on the device. So if you have a one gig phone and you think you have one gig to play with, you don't. You have 128 meg, maybe, maybe 64 meg. And it gets better. Here in the developing world, or the developed world, we think everybody has a five kilo meg or a one gig phone, but they don't. We're seeing in emerging markets new phones coming out where the emphasis is on price. They don't compete on features, they compete on price. Can we get a phone out for 75 US dollars, 50 US dollars, 40 US dollars? And what they do is they compromise on hardware. So you still see the 3 and 4 meg phones running Android 4.3 or 4.4. You even see phones with 128 meg of RAM, I kid you not. And so we have users who have a heat size of 16 meg or less and they want to run the Facebook application. Sometimes it's pre-installed on the phone. Sometimes they've bought that phone, the first phone they've ever owned, the first computer they've ever owned, really, and the first thing they do on it is they go on Facebook and they want to see cat photos. So, that's my job. Give them the cat photos they want, no matter how little memory their device has. So the problem with images is that they're very big. Users and sometimes even developers don't realize how big it is. Sometimes look at how big an image is on disk, so we see a JPEG, and we say, oh, that's only 40K, no big deal. But that's because it's compressed. When you display it on the screen, you have to decompress it. You have to decode it. And then every single pixel has one byte for red, one byte for blue, one byte for green, one byte for alpha, four bytes per pixel. So on a medium-sized screen, that's 1.5 megabytes. I just said you could have as little as 16 meg, and one full screen image takes up a tenth of the memory available to your application. This is not good. This is going to cause a lot of problems. So, we programmed Java on Android. And Java, Java is not something. The great thing about Java, as opposed to a language like C, is that you don't have to worry about memory, right? You can just create an object, and as soon as it goes out of scope, you have this magical wizard called the garbage collector. Garbage collector will come and clean up your garbage and clean your memory and you don't need to worry about it, right? And the problem with programming Java is that you have this guy called the garbage collector who runs at random times. He runs when he feels like it. And every so often, if you can't find enough memory while your application is running, he will stop the world. He will say to every thread in the process, stop, I need more memory. Some guy called new. And while he's looking for that memory, nothing happens. So as you know, Android UI is single thread. There's one thread that looks for UI events. And if this thread is stopped, the user will press the button, scroll to see the next cat photo, and nothing happens. And he gets so pissed off, he writes a hostile review in Google Play Store saying, Facebook sucks! So we actually read these reviews. Um, not something you want to do um, before going to bed. And we say, we have to help these people. They are getting stopped with the world garbage collections. So we have to have fewer garbage collections somehow. So the easiest way to cheat would be to just give them smaller images. And we tested that and we found out it doesn't work. People do not like smaller, low resolution images. I mean, literally, they do not like it. They do not click the like button. They don't share it. They don't comment on it. They would actually rather wait a longer time for these images to download over the net, and they're still more likely to click on a higher resolution image than a lower resolution image. So that's that. We have to give the highest quality we can. But we are faced with the prospect that the new operator, Java, all the time can at any moment stop the world. And that's if it does find the memory in there somewhere. If it doesn't find the memory, you get our friend the box on the top. Does that box look familiar? How many of you have seen it? How many 
have you seen within the past week? And then you can pit 
And when you hit it, it operates like normal memory. The system will not reclaim it because it's an ESY process. Then you can unpin it. And when you unpin it, it is not free. The, whatever you've written there stays there unless the system actually needs that space, at which point it's free. So which means you can actually do sort of a soft free. You unpin the memory, but if you need that data back again, you pin it again, and if the data's still there, it's still there. Just wait for it. So the use of this image is, is fairly obvious. You only need the pixels in a bitmap when it's on screen. So what you can do is, when you uh, first encode a bitmap, you allocate the memory, you pin it, and you show it on the screen. And when it goes off screen, you unpin it. And if it's still there the next time you need to draw it, you pin it again. And if it's been reclaimed, then you have to decode it again for the pump spot. So this sounds like a perfect solution. It only takes up memory when it's on screen. It can be reclaimed when it's necessary. And it's never going to take up more memory than is actually needed to render. And since you only have so many pixels, you're only going to use the screen buffer size pixels. So what could possibly go wrong? As you're about to no doubt guess, there is something very wrong with this. And that's that the thread that is doing this is the UI thread. The one and only UI thread. So most of you know that UI threads should never ever do anything expensive. They should not read from this, they should not read from the network, and they should not do something CPU intensive like, oh, I don't know, decompressing an image. But of course, that's exactly what we're doing. And so if you have a big application with lots of images, and you start scrolling down, and you'll notice every so often you move your finger and there's a little bit of a lag, and then suddenly it jumps up. It's as if the application has gone to sleep for a minute. Well, it kind of has. It's not sleeping, it's decoding an image, and it's doing so on the UI thread. Furthermore, you don't even know when it's happening. This is all deep in kernel space. You can't even log it. All you really notice is that you can measure the frame rate, and you're seeing just drop frames showing up. So this is how we implement this. It's very simple. When you come to the map, you just set this one line here in virtual, and then your the uh, map in virtual. So we talked to Google about this, and he said, "Guys, why are we having defaults on the UI frame? This is really what you want." And I said, "In virtual." You know, we haven't really touched that code in three years. I'm kind of surprised you're still using it. And he said, well, that's what the docs kind of advised you, is why wouldn't we use it? The docs told you that, really? He said, and then you notice know, this paragraph appeared in November of last year, a few weeks after we had an email uh, exchange with them. And now they say most apps should avoid using in virtual. Thank you. Now you tell us. So currently, this is still a solution in fact at Facebook and Instagram. And if you have slow scroll speeds, that's good. So they said you should use the in bitmap flag again instead. So what is the in bitmap flag? So instead of in virtual, you specify in bitmap, and you specify an existing object. So you have a bitmap, and when you want to show something else, you take the same hunk of memory and you go into that. So this way you can allocate, you know, just as many bitmaps as you need for your screen, and just read over and over again. And whenever you need to show something else, you just put something else. So you're never going to use very much memory. It's almost the same thing as virtual, except you can control when the decode happens, so it doesn't tie over your wi -Fi. So again, it sounds like a perfect solution. Why on earth would we not use this? And lots of people do. Um, if you look at the Picasso library from Square, um, that uses the solution. And Facebook, we looked at the solution, we really, really wanted to use it. This looks so awesome. And then we decided not to. We had two reasons. Often I feel with any good API that comes out of Google, it always has to be a catch, and this is the catch. Added an API to level. That's funny. So we have gingerbread phones. And yes, I think the previous speaker showed it's only 16% are still using gingerbread, but we are Facebook. We have not millions of users, we have hundreds of millions of users. And even a gingerbread percentage of those is like the population of a medium-sized country. And you know, there are people too, everybody needs the cat photos. So, we are not going to abandon those users. And Google says, well, okay, you can't reuse them, I can just, you know, dispose of them as soon as you're done with them. But that doesn't perform all that much better. We need to keep the memory under control for the company. And then it turned out there was another problem. Actually, two more problems, even for users of Icebook Sandwich and above. The first problem is the image must be a JPEG or an EMG. This doesn't sound amazing, does it? Except this is Google. 
They're the people who came up with WebP. And WebP is a great format. We find that it gives 20% better compression. And remember, we have people in emerging markets who are spending, I kid you not, as much as 10% of their monthly income on data. And the biggest consumer of that data is Facebook images. And if we give them JPEGs, instead of WebPs, just because of Google's API, they're going to be cut spending a lot of extra money. And that's not right. We can't do that. And even for our users who are not paying so much for data, it's going to make their downloads up in the networks slower. And we find, again, people do not like wait for images. When you're online, one second matters. It really affects how people perceive the image. So we want the tightest compression possible, and that means using WebPs, which Google very conveniently didn't support. And then the second problem is that the image you reuse on Silicon Cash had to be the exact same size, the same width and the same height. Now that's probably for showing the same size image over and over again. We don't do that. We try to keep the aspect ratio exactly what the user uploaded, and we fit it within the width of the screen. And that means we have a large number of sizes, and we want to keep that. We want to be as faithful as possible to what the uploader of the picture originally wanted you to see. And if we standardize into two or three sizes, then we'll be cropping user photos, which is bad, or we'll be rescaling them and lowering the quality, which is also bad. And we don't want to do that. We want to preserve the user experience. So, we can't use a bitmap, and we can't use virtuals. What is our solution? Now, before I go further, I should say this solution is not in production mode. And in all conscience, I can't actually recommend you using it yet. If you want to see it in action, the only way to do so now is to join Facebook's help program. Um, and even then, it's only just being rolled out. It's going to be expanded over the next few weeks, code that is using this solution. And if you find the performance is better than before, by all means, uh, give us feedback. You can send them a report just to say how good the software is to uh, how many of you are in the Facebook Alpha Beta programs? Oh, come on, guys. If you want to see the hot new features in Facebook, you've got to join that. Really? It's worth it. You can always use more text or something. Okay, so this is another piece of source code from Android. And I actually fixed the whole function here because it's too good to resist. This is called Android Bitmap Block Pixels. Such a creative name. It is, as you can see, it's written in C which means that you have to use the native development kit to get to it. So what it does is it takes that, it takes a Java object called jbitmap, and it pulls out that, you know, that uh, C++ pointer, and it calls a function on it called lock pixels. And what lock pixels does is it calls that hash method region call. So the original intention of the function was if you wanted to modify a bitmap native, using native libraries, you could lock the pixels, fill with them, and then unlock them and go on. That was the intention. So there's an Android bitmap on one pixels. What we decided to do was write a new function somewhere, call it lock. And then we do something that's very simple. We lock the pixels and deliberately don't unlock. I brought that for now. This means you have a fully decoded bitmap. You don't have to worry about when it gets decoded, it's decoded when you make a lock. And it's living in hash map. It's not going to take up Java memory, and you control when it gets free. So it goes away when you say it goes away, and it comes in when you say it comes in. It's under your control, but you don't have to worry about it crashing the device. You don't have to worry about it slowing down the device. And so your code looks something like this. You set the invertible option to true, and then you just lock the bitmap. And then when you're done with it, you have to call the recycle method which will free the memory and one more. And that's it. Of course, this guy is. For starters, this is not in the docs. The docs say that you can use this with every way to decode an image except the file and the resource. They are wrong. You cannot decode from the screen. We found this out the hard way. We went through the Android source code and we found this general comment. We don't allow virtual to jump into this case. Uh, we're going to file a report to fix the docs. You have to decode from a byte array or a file to a script, not a file. Otherwise, you cannot get virtually. That is a system limitation. Um, because they don't really support the existence of a virtual anymore, it's unlikely this feature will ever be that. So the important thing to take away from it is, if you are in charge of creating your own memory, suddenly you have to think not like a Java developer, you have to think like a C++ developer. For every allocation of a bitmap, I have to have a call to recycle somewhere. 
If I don't do that, this memory is just going to sit in Azure Map until some unpredictable time, and it's going to lead to crashes. And so you have to think about who owns it. When does it get released? Who is responsible for closing it? C++ developers are used to this, and they have some tools that Java developers don't have. They have shared pointers, unique pointers, you know, syntactic sugar, they have destructors, you know what they're called. Java developers don't have that. And one reason I can't say this is already shipping is because of a large, complicated application such as ours, just figuring out where a bitmap goes away is very, very difficult sometimes. So when are you done with an image? When you scroll that screen, maybe, but the user can scroll right back down again. And what if you keep an images in a cache of some kind? Then what are they done? It's a big different cache, or when the user is not using them. And sometimes you have to make a judgment call. Maybe we'll delete the image now and bring it back, but it's not going to lead to flickering. It's not going to lead to the user spending too much time waiting for images. You need to make trade-offs sometimes. List views are a special case. Um, how many of you have a list of images somewhere that you just scroll through up and down? Okay, quite a few of you. And in red, same concept. So as you know, list views are already are dealing with this problem just with the job views. Views can be expensive to inflate, and just inflating them can slow down the wide thread. So a list view will usually only have as many views, as many child views, as it's showing on screen at any time. And as one goes off screen, another one comes in. So this is the perfect place to hook into. And so there's an interface called Recycler Listener. All you have to do is implement that listener. It has one method called onMove to Scrappy. And when a view is being placed on the Scrappy, you have to have some kind of code that can grab the bitmap out of your view and then remove it from the cache, if there's a cache, and then recycle it. And the problem with that is that you can sometimes see flicker. If you delete an image and then it comes right back again, then it seems to disappear to the user and then come right back. And if you're not careful about how you time this, you can sometimes see flicker. And that's a problem that we have as a bit of time solving. I'm not going to go too far. So that is basically the story of what we call locked kernels. It's the latest, well, one of our motives is, is to hack. So I guess you could call it the hack from Facebook. But I mean that in a good way. We're trying to use the API in a slightly different way than what was originally envisioned to get around limitations in the rest of the API, which I think is legit, all in the interest of giving users the photos they want to see. When you think about images, there's actually a lot you have to do with images. And many applications would benefit from having an image pipeline. Um, again, Picasso has this concept sort of implicitly, although they don't use that word. When you make a request for an image, the first thing you should do is look at a memory cache. And that memory cache should be fast in the UI thread, and then therefore it should be already decoded images. And this has to be small because you only have so much memory. If you don't find a memory cache, you should be looking on a cache on disk. Not really disk, it's the hardware, it's from storage, but basically something that is on hardware that's permanent. And if you can't find it on the disk, if only if you can, then only you can get it off the network. And the important thing is that you should never have the same thread doing all this stuff. On the right hand side, the boxes in blue should each be a separate thread. If you have some kind of task manager that just gets tasks off a queue and does them, whatever, that would be probably the best way to implement this. But how this is going to work is going to vary on how much on your usage patterns. Um, if you're going to transform an image, we find the best results are when you transform the network image and then write it out to disk. Then you don't have to do anything. One thing we do on the older platforms is we take WebP images and we transcode them into JPEG because WebP is not supported on Android 2.3. And after we do that, we cache the JPEG. We don't bother caching the WebP. If you write it back out to the disk cache, don't let that block the user request. Have that happen in parallel to the side. The same thing happens when you write to the memory cache. So this diagram can make your code very complicated. I'm not going to do this right here. But it's worth it. You should have much better performance if you split your code out into small, manageable blocks of work that can be processed in parallel and prioritize as you need to be prioritized. The other trick we're experiencing with is native memory. So there is a, you can define an object with a, a method like this, copy to native, of, let's say a binary. And the Java native interface, and this is not Android specific, this exists on server-side Java as well, has a method called getByteArray region. So all you do is you allocate a C array of Java bytes, which actually are just C car or primitives. And then you can copy whatever is in the Java byte array over to the native byte array. And it turns out that you can stream from the native byte array. So you can download an image off the network 
and you can download just you know, a chunk at a time into GitHub memory and then write it straight to native memory. So let's say you're downloading a you know, 400k image. You only need to have a small buffer, 8k in Java, and the rest of it straight to native. From native, you can write it to this. From this, you can write it back to native. Only limitation is you can't decode, which is really what we need most. The decode operators in Java right now require a Java byte stream or a file script. You can't use data memory for that. But if you're constantly downloading images off the network, you're constantly running them to this, you can do all that without allocating, deallocating, allocating, deallocating. Remember, every new call you make in Java risks having a stop for garbage collection. If you can put that in data memory, you should see your applications in <laughs> have better performance, and that's always worth it. So resizing and scaling and cropping. A lot of the times we can't take images as they are and have to change them in some way. The key thing to remember is devices suck. Your phone was intended to show you cat photos and was not intended really to be a wholesale editor of cat At any rate, it's not a more powerful device than what most of you would have available on your server. If you're downloading an image off the network, have the server send you exactly the resize you want, exactly the problem, exactly everything you want. You shouldn't even touch it once it comes back. Unless it's something the platform doesn't support that it's going back to do. But sometimes you don't have that choice. Sometimes the image was created on the device. The user took a picture of his camera, or some people are writing applications that create images, the user just draws or something. So sometimes you do need to use those things. So there are more than one programming languages out there, as we discovered. And you could use the fairly simple Java APIs to be sized and crop, but that is doing it in uncompressed space, lots and lots of memory. This is a bad thing. If you use native libraries, open source libraries like libjpeg turbo, it's a very good library, or libwebd in Google, it's a equally good library, then you can decode, or you can do all this in the native space, in compressed data. And so once again, you can spare your users a lot of trouble dealing with images, a lot of crashes while resizing images, you just do these operations quickly on the fly. And that's all I have about images. So the key thing to remember is, remember how much images take up, how much memory they take up, use them judiciously, and be sure it's always free when you're done with them. Thank you very much.